So what is... Uh, my point I have made uh, some time ago in a presentation was about this, that we have, and I, I this is heavily influenced by Luhmann, but through him also Husserl is in the background and shoots. Uh, so we live in this complex reality of communications. Um, and communications exists uh, on the one side, they don't exist, but they are in our mind and in our interactions. And they are a layer in itself. And that brings me to the point which I want to make by the transition. How can it be that there is a layer in itself, which is not an attribute to human beings, but a layer in itself, so something on itself. How can that be? And the mechanism, I, I, I thought that was important for going from dual, from single to dual and from dual to three and, and so forth and so forth is the reaction diffusion dynamics. Uh, I don't know if people are uh, familiar with that. That's from Rashevsky in the 30s, uh, Russian. And Alan Turing has further elaborated on that. It means that, and I hope that it is the next slide. Uh, so we are now theorizing about communications which we cannot see, which we, which, which we have to assume as a primary philosophy, Jamie would say. And uh, I wanted to show you this. It's a bit complex and I'm not going to explain you this in detail. It means that the reaction diffusion dynamics means that as you have more production, more flow on the one side, for example, action, then this adds up to a diffusion dynamics because first it spills over and then people, and then on the other side it begins to resonate. So you then no longer only have a production, a reaction dynamics, but also a diffusion dynamics emerging on top of that. And that's the cybernetic mechanism so there is a built-up, bottom-up, and at a certain moment, the next order system is sufficiently populated to generate that diffusion dynamics. <coughs> if the diffusion becomes larger, and that's here, then half the, and that's technical, yeah, the uh, reaction dynamics, then the stable, let's say it becomes unstable, and technically you get a subtle point and it means that the, uh, um, the sign of the, uh, one of, of the second eigenvector changes. So you, you get it here. And then you, what, what is technically called a settle point emerges. And in that settle point there's the option to create not a one-dimensional system, but a two-dimensional system, at least to gain a degree of freedom. And this degree of freedom, when it is further exploited, uncouples the original process from the next order process. So it becomes no longer, of course, communication has to be carried by people, but it is not the issue that they that it is people who do it. The people can be taken out. Yeah, that's what I do here. And then what is steering the communication is no longer the people, but the eigenstructure of the communication. Yeah, and this eigenstructure in terms of, uh, you can also call it principal components from a, a information, from a communication studies perspective, gives you horizons of meaning which can be differentiated. So the meanings can then be codified with reference to a variety of horizons of meaning. 
what does this mean? So what is happening is that you first go from one to two, and one to two can go forward or backward. Here you have it, four, this one is the backward one, and here I have under my picture, I have the forward one. Yeah, so you can have against time, or you can have with time. This is gaining a single dimension, yeah? So then it remains opposite. Once you have more than two, you can make and you can use them as uh, coordinates in a Cartesian space. Yeah, then you have three. Um, so you get a different type of mathematics. And three is interesting because uh, I'm using that for my triple helix metaphor, uh, theorizing or let me do it shortly this way. And no, it doesn't work. No, I didn't. Uh, I must have that. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Go up here. Now, let me take them this one. Here you have the dynamics if you have three. If you have three, you can have clockwise and counterclockwise. So you not only have against time and miss time, you don't have only dual cases, you can get. And once you have these two, these possibilities, let me now move this again to the side. Yes. Then you can have this in with black or you can have it with white. And what does that mean? It means here that you have overlaps, and it means here that you have a lack of overlaps, that there is opening up of the system. <coughs> yeah, I think that's more or less what I wanted to communicate today. Um, what I, let me take first this one. So you can get the horizontal differentiation of the different codes in the communication, and that's central to the triple helix thesis. Uh, you can also you also have the vertical differentiation that you have relations between people, which provide meaning to each other. In an, I, I, the the essential point is to, that this is relational and this is positional. Once you have positions, you can have meaning. I will, I'm not going into detail about that and you can have the codification of meanings in horizons of meaning. And once you have C, you have this possibility of an overlay. Um, so let me take this one more. So you can, if there's no overlap, then you can have an overlay where all the, all the in-between um, relations function and carry the next order system and the next order one is then the theta heater. So you no longer have three. On the bottom you have here three, but then on top of that, the new one. And here the reaction diffusion mechanism is the mechanism for this extension. Okay, I hope that relates a bit to dual phase, which I still, I read a bit now about it, but uh, that's psychology, that's not my field. Thank you for your attention. Uh, Lloyd, uh, Peter asks you to give a clear definition about the meaning. Um, a clear <coughs> definition about meaning in, in just... The meaning of a meaning. <laughs> a, I can give a receiving one. System, a receiving system by selecting among the communication, uh, among the information, the communications, the uncertainty, gives meaning to that uncertainty. Whatever the receiving system is, a discourse or an observer, I think that's the most general level. Is it somewhat helpful? Or okay, I'm not sure to say that. 
how do I get back to my normal skin? How do I get out of this? Oh, I, I just have to close the PowerPoint, I suppose. Yes, here. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So you... Meaning is that what we provide unavoidable to what comes in. That's at the individual level, but at the social level, it can come into the discourse. Peter has a different definition. Well, I've worked on, I've worked on theories and conceptions of semiotics. Um, and um, meaning, um, meaning is the, in my view, is the effect of, of a, a message uh, on the recipient, either in terms of subsequent behavior, so that's a behaviorist measure, or in terms of changes in internal representation, such as beliefs. Um, that would be an internalist uh, measure. You know, how does hearing about some message come to you, it's raining outside, change your behavior and or your model, uh, world model of what's going on outside vis-a-vis -vis the weather. So, you know, in semiotic terms, there can be um, syntactic, semantic, and pragmatic meaning, subdivisions of types of yeah. meaning. Sure. You know, what is the effect of a, um, of a change in uh, computer code on the subsequent, you know, behavior of the computer? That would be a syntactic meaning. Uh, what is the change in uh, one's um, representations of the world uh, that would be a change in semantic meaning. Uh, what would be a, a change in uh, one's, um, if the message is, is related to one's goals, uh, then uh, that's a pragmatic uh, dimension of meaning. Um, so so that, that's my working definition of meaning. Um, and, yeah. um, you know. If I may, uh, then I'll, I'll react. I always, I, I I must say that the semiotic approach confuses me sometimes. Uh, well, I think the personally the step, is largely incoherent. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the next step is, in my opinion, the step which is most explicated by Niklas Luhmann, which I mentioned in the background, Edmund Husserl, who is there, that there is subjective and intersubjective meaning. And that these two are, uh, are two very different references and that they are also expected to be very different uh, dynamics at work. So mm -hmm. the dynamics at work in the, in, in the individual is integrative, while the dynamics at work in the intersubjective can be differentiating. So we can have different horizons of meaning in the communication, while as an individual, we try to, for example, to uh, integrate in order to prevent dissonances, cognitive dissonances or other different dissonances. So we sort it out in a single hierarchical model. Well, you could say that uh, to use the old Greek idea of it, opposed to hierarchical is hierarchical, so that you get different domains, which span along different eigenvectors of the communication ma matrix and then develop with different dynamics also. Some, yeah, for example, the dynamic in, in the economy, it's important to retain wealth from knowledge. Yeah, so from the flow, the retainment mechanism, so the organization is the important uh, uh, dimension and in the, for example, in the sciences, uh, uh, it is the self-organization, the flux through the organization, which is most important. But it is not black and white. All these systems have all these elements. They all have interactions underneath organizations as a first level and on top of that self-organization. If I could respond as a cultural anthropologist, 
what Luke just said in terms of the subjective and intersubjective is something that we really need to be thinking about because the subjective is what I'm thinking in my mind. Uh, the intersubjective is what the American founders distinguished between the small M of mind and the capital M of the mind of the culture. And the whole American experiment was founded upon that simple distinction. And that aspect of subjective versus intersubjective needs to be resident in our analyses of the problems that we hope to be confronting with. The second point that is being made by Lute is the importance of encoding and decoding, which is something that I've never really fully understood from Rosen's model of the formal system, our minds, and what's happening in the world out there. But you know that aspect of how we process information, encoding, how our identity influences that That's processing, that. and the aspects of relationships, organizations that can change the way we process information and our identity. So encoding, decoding, subjective, intersubjecting are really themes we need to hammer on. Um, looking at the act of communication, which is what PASC and others tried to get out of the swamp of intersubjectivity cul-de-sacs. So the yes. idea is, Jamie, I, I'll give it so in a moment. You go ahead first. Uh, you go ahead. The, the idea... And that comes from Parsons, essentially, Parsons Media Theory, um, that the, the codes, they're not out there, they're, but we live in them. So we live in, in communications which are coded, and we know that some things cannot be said in some context because the codes block that, but we also, at other places, it is the codes which make it possible for us to say things and to shortcut things. A simple code, of course, which is usually used as the example, is money. Yeah? We don't have to negotiate the price, but we can just pay. That's one code. These different uh, horizons of meaning can overlap or not overlap, and they use codes for them. But I don't want them to make them actors. Like, but the picture of Max Weber of the gods is nice. The key gods are not here, but they can be among us. Sometimes they are here. Sometimes Athena, you see, is operating. Okay, Jamie, I'm sorry. Um, no, that's you're the guest of Homer. <laughs> Um, I was uh, going to, to follow up to what Lowell said uh, regarding uh, intersubjectivity uh, uh, through a Popperian lens. The way that I understand that Popper is adding to this conversation, and I should make very clear, I, I treat Popper as a work in progress. So he didn't say that like with, with a banner heading and... Um, we, we can discuss that further, but what we call intersubjective, we're actually talking about artifacts uh, or Popper's world tree. And it's unfortunate that he didn't use the word artifact more often, uh, but, but an artifact, or we can call it a symbol. And so that in Popper's view, there are like 7.6 billion subjective beings in the Levinasian terminology that are irreducible into the same. So 7.6 billion people that we don't really know 100% certain what they're thinking, not even 95% certain. We just have no clue. And, and there we is, communicate there with the aid of, of symbols uh, or artifacts and then decisions are being made and now uh, what 
what is very important in Popper's uh, view is that he, he, he sets us up as our mind. He, he doesn't reduce the mind in something else. He, he just, what is a mind? It's a storytelling mechanism. So each one of us, the, the subjective world is we have a, a story. We have a bundle of stories that started the moment we were born. And that story is the context in which we give meaning. And part of that story is that we think that other people agree with us 100%. But that's actually our story. That's not necessarily the reality. And um, so in this view, to just get back to the subjective war, uh, I would say the intersubjective is, is really the artifacts, in this case, the texts that we kind of agree to give a, a, an a agreed on meaning and specifically logic and mathematics are kind of the great accomplishments in that we really agree on what it means. But then we have the challenge of what do we meaning, what sort of meaning do we add to our logical symbols? And that's where the world tree comes into play. So the world tree in terms of this theory is the coach of communication. And the coach of communication, the Herbert Simon is a useful there is an alphabet of them. There's not four or five. The Parsons thought there were four. Uh, some people think there are three. Uh, other some people believe in second order, so it's not allowed to say three. Uh, but there is an alphabet of them, and and they are extended over the over the history. So we can ask the question: If science has a code of communication. Nikolaus Luhmann answers, yes, it does. It is truth, which is the cause of communication. I think that's too simple. Good truth uh, yeah. is yeah. black and white. It yes. is truth finding. Yeah, Herbert Simon again. So, and then people ask, is technology in a separate code of communication? Perhaps it is. We can, and then we can do comparative research about, for example, citations in science and citations among patents and say they are differently organized so the meaning of the same thing may be different between science and technology but that, had, that hasn't always been the case that's since 1870 that that begins yeah so we can have differentiations in those codes enriching our communication systems but these codes are selection mechanisms, eh? keep in mind. So they are also disciplining us. Yes, and, and I would say, do, are those, would you agree if it's called like codes of negotiation, yeah. how to negotiate? But there is no assumption that we have to agree. There will yeah. be a distribution. But we, we have to kind of agree or disagree whether we continue the conversation and that there is a subtle um like always in the back of oh, i'm going to step out of the conversation because I, I i don't think it's giving me anything so so negotiation is that background dynamic of keeping it relevant to everyone or, or sticking my on. answer would be yeah. it's probably one of them okay mm -hmm. what i think is important here is what was uh -huh. the difference between subjective and intersubjective we started our discussions in this club of Remy about social change oh, yeah. i'm online I'm I'm very good. Change. You say? Well, mute your mic no not at all can you turn off your microphone, please? He muted Oh, oh. Thanks. I'll, I'll pop the other help if I Burn it. Okay. Turn off your microphone, please. Oh, sorry, I'm involved in an online meeting about... Uh... You can turn off your microphone. <laughs> God knows He's what not hearing us. About. Anyway, what, what, what do you like? Okay, I'm yeah, muted. I, I was just saying the, the issue we approached 
the Club of Rimi was with social change. And what Lute just pointed out in terms of the difference between subjective and intersubjective is the crux of social change. One of the aspects uh, that I worked with, uh, his name was Everett Rogers out at California, San sure. at, uh, Stanford. And he wrote the book on diffusion of innovations. So, uh, so uh, I'll talk about that later. <laughs> Sure. Subjective. Uh, exist. Hmm? What's happening? Uh, okay. Uh, Peter, you want to talk? Sure. Um, so, you know, um, pri private meanings uh, are usually people outside of, of the social sciences maybe would talk about private meanings and public meanings. Uh, private being the uh, subjective uh, meaning that only we have access to uh, and that encompasses all of our re re actions and previous experiences. Uh, and so it's individual. And intersubjective meaning or public meanings which are uh, basically social conventions that are agreements uh, and they're rough and kind of crude agreements about, about what, when I say a particular word, what it means. But intersubjective meaning is not, um, is not well-defined or clear or, and there's all, not, all, not just one intersubjective meaning. There as many intersubjective meanings as there are combinations of people. Um, you know, and I, I put it in the chat, if, if, if I say cat, uh, you know, I could mean my house pet, or I could mean uh, any animal of a family of cats, like tigers or lions or cheetahs or what have you. So, um, and um, intersubjective meaning doesn't, meaning itself, even though that there are texts that can persist over, well over people's lifetimes, or even for millennia, um, the meanings of those texts always have to go through an interpreter, uh, and that interpreter is always uh, in, in constructing an, a, a private meaning of what that me of, of what the text, what the effect of the text is. So meanings don't exist uh, outside of uh, individual uh, cognizers. I guess that that's what I would say. So, um, if I may, um, so. What you say is, let's say we have 7 billion people uh, on the earth and then we have all the possibility, impossible interactions. That's 7 billion minus 1 times 7 billion. So we have all those interactions. The question is that these interactions get socially structured. Yes. Sure. They're not just all those billions of interactions. There are mechanisms at work which make those interactions structured. Sure. So, and these uh, mechanisms are now proposed that, they, that we can think about those mechanisms as codes in the communication. But the codes are not all agreed on. That's what I'm trying to say, is that um, there are codes in terms of the syntax of the, of the messages. If I say work, you know, W-R-O-K, that may mean something different to me than it does to you. And it uh, may mean something different in the economy than it may but, than uh, in another uh, configuration. Well, I, I think what Lot is trying to say, and, and uh, which I, I think I agree with, uh, but it, it's, what has happened in this conversation is that the focus has been on the difficulty in communicating as opposed to the possibility and the positive aspects of how you can communicate exactly and uh, and the meaning be, has uh, good if you would staying power good good form such that the meaning is grasped by the other individuals who understands those forms and so in, in this context, the positive aspects of meaning 
can be created among the uh, cultural subgroup, which is very, very effective in communication. And, and of course, this is, uh, depends to a large extent on having a common understanding of the symbol systems which are involved in the communication. And yes. so it requires, uh, for positive communication, you need to have uh, communication between individuals who are cognizant of a particular symbol system. And uh, that, of course, yes. is then yeah. an educational issue. Through, through conversation, we, we, we co-evolve our private meanings so that they are coordinated in, in terms of intersubjective meanings. I, that's what I see. That's my understanding of past theory of conversation. Just so, told, if you take evolution. an example, if I may. The co-evolution of, of, um, of private meanings and intersubjective uses of words so that our behaviors are better coordinated. You know, so you say something and, 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 and I interpret it and I nod my head. Uh, and then you know that you're sort of then you know that you're using a word in a, in a manner that I, that I find meaningful. And, and, and so there's, a, there's an iterate, iterative um, process of coevolution of the internal observables or, or interpretations that we have yeah. of the words. Let's and take an example. May I say something about yeah. that conversation? Uh, ben, may, may I just finish this? You. And uh, should the if you look at one of the concrete mechanisms of those coordination mechanisms, the market is the simplest one. Yeah. So on the market, we have simplest? the possibility of the exchange in, in goods, in commodities. We have the possibility to pay cash, or we can pay with credit, or we can pay with uh, cards, or, but there's a limited set. That's the point. I'm oh, sorry, Ben. Bennett. Go ahead. Oh, thank you very much. So I didn't wish to um, speak over you. Uh, I just just in agreement with what Peter's been saying. I've just posted a little message in the in the chat where I say intersubjectivity, the conversations of intersubjectivity they include what the participants believe, what the others believe, including what the what you believe the other believes about you. You know, these are perceptions and meta meta perceptions. Uh, and that's what's happening between us right now. We're all struggling, or, or more or less, to understand each other and understand what each other think, understands about us. Uh, and I want to give an example of this. There's it, it, a biography um, from, I've forgotten, it, my, my brain goes when I'm tired. Feynman, the, the, the physicist. I've forgotten his first name. Yeah, Feynman. Feynman? Richard. Oh. Richard, Richard, Richard. Uh, he describes uh, a, a kind of typical scenario. This is where two, two quantum physicists are discussing their latest thoughts and findings, and each is armed with a, a, a chalk, a piece of chalk, and they have a blackboard. And they are making all these symbols, but they, they are all the time struggling to understand each other. So the symbols are some help, but they only partially a help to what to, to help to understand each other's uh, understandings. It becomes, a, it becomes a dance. One person likens it to a dancing with the other to understand them. But it's, this is, I, I found this description, I found it so, uh, you know, kind of beautifully eloquent about how it is can, difficult it can be to understand another's thinking, especially when it's abstract and complex. Thank you. So belief is an attribute to individuals again. Of course, we can also have belief systems, but if you take, for example, the uh, other coordination mechanisms, like for example, uh, the economy, then you lose that individualistic perspective. And particularly, I would say, my, that's my interest in science, where also people have analyzed the sciences as belief systems, they overlooked that the systems are, and that the sciences are systems of rationalized expectations, Popperian type of uh, systems, which do evolve independent 
at an, or carried by human beings, but not in terms of the dynamics of human beings. Did I hear you say not in terms, not in terms of the dynamics of human beings? No. Uh, what did will you say? Be replaced. Yes. Yes. Uh, I, I, comment, I, mean. I comment again. Lou seems to me to be doing macro sociology in the same way that Lumen and Parsons did. So he's doing it in a Lumen way. And macro sociologists won't see this abstract system, which is the social system, and they separate it away from individual consciousness, individual persons. Now, my question to who is it who is interpreting the form and dynamics of this abstract system? The, that's the science. The community. That's the yeah. science. Which community? It, it's still Which the economists? Yes. The no. economists? The sociologists? It's back to being a conversation between human beings. So, it's loot. A, I agree yes. that it is a discourse. I'm sorry, Jamie, go ahead. Well, I, I was going to amplify Bernard's comment. Um, like, the what else is there than human beings? That's why I started with the reaction diffusion mechanism. In populating the system, you need human beings. Well, but once it is generated, it takes over control. And what is taking over control? That's the codes of the communication. Well, but the codes themselves are uh, inf the, uh, infused with meaning of the individual. So what you're actually describing is a couple of individuals who think they're superior to everyone else and they form a private club. And they say, we, we're going to decide what the code is. And No, and no, no. It's more yeah, I mean, what, what it else is, is it? It is because not. It's a hypothesis. Because there is a literature, I, I just like to refer back to uh, psychoanalysis, object relations uh, branch, that kind of describes how uh, babies think first as if they're the gods, and then, and then they learn to participate. But so what you call non-human, I, I think it's a secret uh, infantile desire to be a god. and. No, it is... And that, that is just expressed oh, no. in sophisticated no. academic language. I gave you the paper uh, where I gave the, the quotations from Freud. Yeah, And Parsons even says at some places, had Freud lived long enough, he had become a sociologist. Freud is clearly yeah. aware that there is structure which is reproduced through us not that we are reproducing, that we are reproducing. We are not in control. Yes, I, I'm uh, making a reference to Ian Sutty and the object relations branch. And, and uh, that is uh, a way of thinking in psychoanalysis that made the break with the machine metaphor in Freud. I, I, I just want to repeat that. So I'm not making a reference to Freud because Freud I think the problem is that he uses this machine, the hydraulic machine metaphor, how it, it cannot be more clear. And, uh, uh, Jamie, anyway, I, don't, yeah. I don't think uh, object relations takes you far enough because what we're trying to do in cybernetics is take uh, beyond the object into relationship structures. Yeah, uh, the, you, and, you hear and, your, sorry. And, and what, what I think is important here is you know what is the frontier of cybernetics that we're trying to noodle towards, and I think uh, Kenneth Bolding talked about the image, and uh, Lude is talking about the coding that allows that intersubjective strange attractors to occur, and that is a real challenge for us because other people aren't doing that. Lude, uh, sorry, Lowell, you. you did, did you hear what you just said? You say object relations doesn't take us far enough because it doesn't pay attention to the relations. Object okay. relations is all about relations. 
and how we think about relations. I mean, so it, it fits in nicely into cybernetics. Now, there is a person... How, how we I'm, think about things is a subjective issue. We have a subjective and inner subjective, which are two different orders. May, okay. may, I, may I comment? This is a partially in support of what Lute's saying, what other people are saying about codification, as it were. There's some lovely work uh, by um, Roy Rappaport, anthropologist, student of Gregory Bateson. Uh, it's called Pigs for the Ancestors. If you've never read it, I, I recommend it to you because he takes a system cybernetics view uh, and he, he, he studies the uh, dynamics of a uh, non, you know, a pre-literate pre culture, and he, he identifies, um, you know, symbolic code, well, symbolic codes, if you like, but behaviours which are uh, repeated in ritual over a four-year cycle to do with planting the root, the rumbin tree, and uh, feeding the pigs. All sorts of things are wrapped up, and the whole community takes part in these ritual behaviours, which sustain the community. Uh, and they also have mock fights with, the, with their neighbours on a ritual basis. All of this sustains the community and the communities around them. And the, the point is that every individual in that community will have some perception of what is going on, but not one of them can properly fully articulate everything that is happening to make the society work. It's the anthropologist, the participant anthropologist outside, i.e. Rappaport himself, who eventually identifies the form of these cultural dynamics. So there's something, there's something going on which is um, intersubjective or, or super subjective that the individuals are not as individuals aware of the whole story. So we can say that of any culture is not quite the same as abstracting out something like the economy or technology or science, but it's Got a similar idea. There's, there are things going on that we're not necessarily aware of all the, all the codings, if you like, or all the cultural forms and structures that we are uh, abiding by right now. The things that you know we do not know are all our own social conditioning. It's a lot. Takes a lifetime to unpack everything, I think, including including what the parents and uh, stuck into us as the super ego. So it finished. What would you say, Bernard? Uh, Herbert Simon's hypothesis that it is an alphabet. Well, alphabet is a word. I mean, I don't. What 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 do you mean by alphabet? Let's say that the assumption is that there are between twenty and thirty of those codes. Well, and then we can begin to think about how we can test it. Well, al al alphabets are tools for constructing words, which in, which if you like, codify or, or, or write down things. So amino acids, for example, are an alphabet. Well, to the external when, uh, observer, but that's it. I mean, you, you are looking at the, the, the amino acids of the human body hasn't created an alphabet. It just happens to look like, it, metaphorically, it looks like an alphabet, but it's not an alphabet. It's only what we as external observers have imposed on the genetic okay. system. So, yeah, well, one has to distinguish between the forms of the symbols and the meaning. And the, the notion of alphabet uh, originates in the notion of sounds. Well, the amino acids originate in the, in the notions of chemistry and the, the symbol system of chemistry as being identities within that. Uh, <clears throat> and this is two rather different origins of these symbol systems. Yeah, well... Alphabets come originally come the earliest alphabets are found in the not alphabets actually but in the um, in the Egyptian whatever we call them hieroglyphics. Okay. Oh, okay, I'm confusing. I'm confusing the description. I dropped the notion of alphabet. It was just importing something which Herbert Simon made at some point, and I, I okay, saw... yeah, but this is the problem with language. The problem with how we use words. I mean, even the word word is is is. Okay. can be unpacked in enormous detail. And, uh, yeah. But, but I would add here that these, these symbols, if the issue in communication among human beings is when you translate it or, or transform it, really, 
into some written form that has some sense of uh, ability to be communicated across time and space. And these written symbols uh, are not uh, independent of one another. They're quite uh, interdependent with one another and the interpretations of them can be quite intersubjective uh, so that the underlying symbol systems have, uh, if you would, different notions of what the symbolic communication is about. And so the example of amino acids is very clear. This communication about amino acid symbols in proteins and in uh, catalysis in, in living systems is very clear and distinctly different from the notions of the symbol systems in the notion of sounds and words in a dictionary, ordinary language dictionary. But, but they have commonalities. Um, so, so people are using alphabet in, in different senses of the word. You know, in, in terms of the DNA genetic code, uh, an alphabet means that you have a set of, of primitives that are recombined. In it can be recombined in various ways to generate particular different effects, i.e. construction of different proteins and therefore different phenotypic uh, 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 ramifications. Of course, uh, of course. So in that general, in that more general uh, conception of alphabet, um, the DNA codons form an alphabet. You can re rearrange them. Yeah, but, but you're using, uh, uh, Peter, in that context, the, the word alphabet is being used as a metaphor. It's well, taken. everything yes. is a metaphor in that way. No, no, it, um, no it's not. No. It's not so because there is a no. distinctive relationship that is in the sense of calculations between the uh, numerical symbols used to uh, describe a symbol system uh, and the composition of these symbol systems between one another. Thus, we find a relationship between the symbols for entropy and the symbols for chemical change and the, single, the symbols for um, quantum mechanical changes. These, quote unquote, different alphabets have an intrinsic relationship among them in the communications within the people who are familiar with those languages, those different forms of representation. Well, they're so comfy, it's more but, than metaphoric. But, but in terms of just the basic symbols um, and, uh, and their readouts, in, in, in the ways in which those things are interpreted, um, you know, I've defined a sense of the word alphabet that I think is reasonable in some context. Um, I'm not claiming that it's a universal meaning or intersubjectively, you know, universal meaning of any sort. I'm just saying that's the meaning in which it makes sense to talk about the genetic code as yeah, but we get we get the same by an alphabet. Yes, but, we get the yes, same use of the word language. People talk about the language of the genes, the language of the yeah. beads. Yes. Yes, word. you can use it on all these it's terms, used. and in this context, you can use the notion of alphabet. But what you really mean by this, if you would, multi-disciplinary uh, notion of alphabet is that you can take permutations of these symbols. First, a, a set of symbols, which yeah, in, in terms yeah. of Jason's notion yeah. of yeah. order, and you can order these symbols in different ways to give different meanings. Yeah, yes. So the context within this is that permutation groups become the basis of uh, words in the alphabet. And so this is the connection in which I'm referring to is a rather exact connection. Right. I mean, in, in general, in science, one can provide operational definitions. Yes. If I, if I, ask, yeah, if I ask you to sh explain your, your alphabet of operon cycles or whatever, you would provide me with diagrams, examples, views down microscopes. You would operationalize things. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so yes, and, and they involve orientational metaphors, structural orientational metaphors. So, I mean, in, in past terms, when, you, when he, we, we, Task and I did knowledge and task analysis, we'd analyze the concept webs that, or concept topic webs that people had. But for every concept, like Alfred, there would be a requirement to provide 
what we call the task structure, which is basically a set of operations which show, in quotes, what you mean by the labels you've got. And yes, it, and, and, still is a and yes, yes, vision. You expect oh. those within the scientific community to be uh, truth functions that actually relate directly to nature or natural laws or, or some other uh, well, common verifiability, community. Well, verifiability, empirical verifiability. I have a question to Lloyd. Truth, truth is that which you can verify. It's you only related verify, to that yeah. which you can verify. Just as a, a lovely example, I, a few, many years ago now, I read uh, um, Einstein's account of, of relativity, his own book. And he made it fully clear from the outset that you begin with a clock and a ruler, possibly a, possibly a scale, I can't remember, but from the clock and the ruler, everything follows. You are measuring things at all times and all the paradox, you know, all the complexity comes out of the operations. That's not the cybernetic model. That's a model where everything follows from an origin. Well, and the cybernetic that. model is that if you have the metaphor, for example, bottom-up, then at a certain moment, the order is reversed because a control mechanism is created. Yeah. And then the, the alphabet, as we commonly know it, and you are using it, the linguistic one, is a special case of what Lord. we can call... Uh, well, I, what, I, what Einstein was saying was... What is the measure? And all science is based upon the measure of movement. I, Cybernetics I, deals yeah, with Einstein's, measure. Uh, measure Einstein's, ambition, Einstein's ambition is to derive everything, like in a God-made universe. Yes. Right. But, but what we're but talking that, about that, here that is it. the measure of measurement. It's, it's uh, an that's an the cybernetic system. Lloyd, I have, I have a question. Uh, the, mm, when you say horizons of uh, meaning, horizon is a metaphor. And now we are talking about the uh, uh, alphabet here. So what do you uh, perceive the relationship between this horizon metaphor and uh, this uh, 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 alphabet metaphor? What, what, what would you okay. say? Okay, I think it is very important to see the difference between historical development and evolutionary uh, dynamics. And in the his historical development, we have trajectories of observables, so the, both over time and at each moment of time, and, they can, and you can have complexities. And through the reaction diffusion mechanism, another dimension is added, and that's the idea that we can have regimes. And that's what I mean.